Hello, welcome to Petrochronics, a research group and extension project focused on petrochronology and its geodynamic implications. We are a group based in Brazil that also has an international network of collaborators. They present the reside in Brazil, Australia, Finland, Germany, Italy, Switzerland and the US. Petrochronology involves several areas of the geological knowledge. We seek to disseminate it in a judicious, yet clear and accessible manner. In our researches, we use macro and microscopic observations, combining fieldwork, detailed petrography, thermodynamic modeling, processes dating, geochemical characterization, and much more. From the natural record, we seek to characterize and quantify petrological processes in representative samples, generating comprehensive data sets that are interpreted considering the geodynamic processes that govern the Earth system. We want to share research, from the basic concepts to the state of the art, promoting courses, spreading work results and providing the collaborations between institutions and people. We understand that open science is vital to take down barriers to knowledge and we prioritize the collaborative and open nature of our research. We also propose discussions on integrity and responsibility in the scientific environment. As values, we believe in diversity, representativeness and access to information. We seek to mirror these values in our initiatives. On the YouTube channel, we promote the PTT Talk series, which are presentations on methodologies and advances in cutting-edge research with petrochronology. Our actions also include the organization of lectures, courses, workshops and meetings open to the community. On Instagram and Twitter, we share, on Tuesdays, photos of outcrops and rocks in the field, illustrating geodynamic processes. And, on Thursdays, photos of thin sections with microscopic features with interesting minerals and textures, reflecting different reactions and petrological processes. So, if you work with petrochronology or are interested in related topics, be sure to follow us and get in touch. We want our community to grow even more. See you! Hi, everyone. Hi, how are you? Hi, everyone. Hey, hi. Hey. So, hello, hello, everyone. Welcome, everyone. Uh, thank you all for being here today. So, this is the 23rd PTT Talk by Petrochronics, and we have the great pleasure to have here with us Dr. Stefania Curvo from the University of Pavia. Thank you very much, Stefania, for accepting our invitation to present a little bit of your research for us and for the people who follow us on YouTube. Uh, I'm Otavio Santana, a PhD candidate at the Federal University of Minas Gerais. And hosting this talk with me, we also have Dr. Bruno Ribeiro, a research associate at Curtin University. Guto Paiva is not here. Uh, Dr. Regiane Fumis, a research at the São Paulo State University, and Dr. Silvia Volante at the ETH Zurich. Uh, thank you all for hosting this talk with me. Uh, and thanks again, Stefania, for joining us. We are looking forward to hear about what you have to say about your research. And now I pass the word for Regiane, who will address a little bit about your our group. So, Regiane, it's all thank yours. You, thank you, Stefania Corvo, for being here with us. And thank you also, Bruno and Silvia and Otávio, 
We are the Petrochronicus. The Petrochronicus is a extensional and uh, research group based in, on Brazil. And we have also several people from around the world. We focus in petrochronology, so we have some research and some extension like this PTD talk that is these actions that you ask for research is talk about and really nice talks about petrochronology. So we have also our actions in the Instagram and uh, Twitter. So you invite everyone to join us and also follow us in our social medias. So now I pass the word from Bruno, please. Thanks everyone. It's my great pleasure to introduce Stefania. Uh, she recently, I would say recently, graduated from her PhD at the University of Pavia. And now she's a postdoc, a research associate at the, or research fellow at the University of Pavia, working on crystal rheology and how we can reveal the evolution of the continental crust using microstructures and tiny little evidences of the processes, which I am a big fan. So I'll leave to Sylvia to introduce the talk and I hope you all enjoy it. Thank you, thanks Bruno. So um, today Stefania will tell us a little bit about her research topic, which examines the micro to mesoscale. Um, at the micro to mesoscale, the role played by structural metamorphic heterogeneities along crustal scale shear zone in controlling the rheological behavior and the pressure, temperature, time, deformation and composition um, of metamorphic rocks. So uh, to do this, Stefania applied a multidisciplinary method combining field-based observation integrated with the uh, petrochronological, geochemical, microstructural analysis and thermodynamic modeling. So uh, Stefania will tell about uh, her results obtained on high pressure and high temperature metamorphic rocks from the Cima di Gagnone in the Central Alps and on sheared rocks from an extensional uh, shear zone in the Western Alps. So without further ado, take it away, Stefania. Okay. Thank you for inviting me, uh, first of all. Um, so, yes, uh, in this presentation today, I will uh, uh, mostly um, show the main results of my PhD uh, project um, and uh, mostly what I uh, going on during my postdoc. Um, so uh, just to mention something uh, about me, uh, yes, I came, how oh, they mentioned, uh, I came from the University of Pavia, so to the north of Italy, uh, close to Milan. And uh, it's here that, uh, especially at the Department of Earth and Environmental Science, uh, I have uh, currently my uh, postdoc uh, um, uh, position. Uh, here I uh, um, perform my PhD uh, in March uh, 2022. Uh, I want to leave uh, some uh, um, uh, words also uh, relative to my teamwork uh, that I, um, I devoted to. Uh, and this is my official uh, tutor is Matteo Maino, that is associate professor in structural geology at the University of Pavia. Uh, and Antonio Langone, that is associate professor in uh, geochemistry, always at the University of Pavia. And uh, then there is uh, Mattia Bonazzi, that is uh, another postdoc uh, expert in geochemistry and, and also mineralogy, and is now ma lab manager of uh, the laser CPMS um, at the EGG uh, CNR, an institute that uh, has uh, the base at the, inside the Department of Earth Environmental Science in Pavia. So with all this uh, big team, I, um, I have to thanks for uh, uh, the collaboration I have, um, not only with uh, the EGG CNR, but also with other institutes, not only in Italy, uh, like University of Padova, uh, Turin, and, uh, and uh, also Sassari, but also with uh, foreign uh, institutes, just to mention a few, uh, the SUPSI, the uh, University in Switzerland, and uh, um, the uh, Karlsruhe Institute uh, uh, in Germany, and the University of Leeds. Um, 
yeah, especially here, there is uh, Sandra Piazzolo, a uh, full professor in, stru in structural geology and tectonics, where I spent during my PhD a couple of months learning uh, EBSD techniques. So um, how you can uh, um, see from uh, my team, I, um, I increase my expertise in metamorphic petrology and also in micro microstructural geology. My project now has uh, the title of strain localization in the lower continental crust. And uh, so what I, I do in my research is uh, to uh, try to unravel, especially geological processes that occur in correspondence of uh, uh, crust geological boundaries that I will show better later what I mean. Uh, and uh, I use a, a multidisciplinary approach uh, to investigate this process um, that focus uh, on uh, investigation at the micro, meso scale in order to unravel macro scale phenomena. Uh, I apply all this, uh, especially on high pressure, high temperature rocks from lower continental crust, especially from the Alps, but uh, not only. So my research uh, has the beginning from uh, a common problem that uh, many of us try to unravel is uh, the fact that uh, the configuration of the earth, uh, how we can see it now, is nothing else than the results of uh, plate tectonics. But uh, plate tectonics, uh, uh, in fact, is uh, the uh, process, especially at the boundary of, plate, uh, of the plates, that the main geological processes uh, occur, like earthquakes, volcanic eruption. And it's also here that uh, uh, the formation of lithosphere um, focus is localized, and is uh, where is here where the uh, particular tectonic structure develops, such as faults, shear zone, and the boudin edge, and so on. And these tectonic structure are nothing else than the results of uh, a strong interaction between metamorphic and deformation processes. Uh, these are in turn uh, influenced by uh, rheology that uh, is in turn influenced by the rock composition, circulation of fluids, stress magnitude, pressure and temperature conditions. And all these factors, in fact, strongly influence both metamorphism and deformation. The question that is still open is, uh, but how this factor and uh, this factor control the evolution of the tectonic metamorphic structure from micro, micro scale to macro scale? The way that I try to unravel this uh, uh, question is to uh, focus on particular key location that consisted in the cluster geological boundaries. And it's here where it's possible to better study the strong interplay between metamorphic and deformation processes. So this is uh, my, um, the cluster geological boundaries are my uh, main uh, object of studies uh, is uh, uh, when I talk about crustological boundaries, I mean something that is possible to see in the picture on the right. Uh, that means uh, um, rocks with different lithologies, such as mafic rocks, ultramafic rocks, in contact with uh, um, uh, strongly different uh, uh, rocks, metasediments. And these rocks in contact with each other create a strong different uh, uh, behavior uh, when uh, um, they are influenced by different pressure temperature conditions and by the formation. And the question that I tried to unravel during my PhD was mostly to uh, try to understand how dif these different pair of types record the contrasting metamorphic conditions, even if uh, they show the same uh, structural features, and how um, and which are the factors that uh, lead to the nucleation of shear zone. So my method, uh, my approach start always from uh, accurately geological mapping and sampling strategy. Then I go on with a classical petrographic characterization of the study sample. Then I um, add and perform uh, detailed microstructural characterization by SEM, EBSD, that uh, EBSD in particular I learn and what is possible uh, thanks to the collaboration with the University of Leeds. And then um, the geochemical analysis are also important uh, because uh, they allow to uh, obtain uh, data relative to bulk composition, measure elements, trace elements. 
Then I usually add uh, and uh, try to reconstruct uh, pressure and temperature composition conditions uh, by using uh, um, geothermobarometric model or thermodynamic modeling. And then uh, finally, what is the last is the time. I define the time uh, with uh, performing ge geochronological analysis on the main uh, accessory mineral that uh, occur in the study rocks, especially on Titan and Zircon or Monazite. And all this allowed then to reach the uh, reconstruction, the pressure, temperature, time, the formation composition path of the rocks. So um, in this presentation, I will show uh, mostly the results relative to two case studies from the Alps uh, that are chosen at the beginning of my PhD because we are representative of lithological boundaries and of processes focused in the middle to lower crust and that are relative to opposite regional tectonic regime. The first one is uh, the Cima di Gagnone area in the Central Alps and is uh, a case, uh, um, an example of alpine high pressure, high temperature metamorphism deformation during a classical orogenetic and subduction collision contest. And the second case study is the Anzola Shell Zone in the Ivra Verbano Zone, is the, and is an example of a pre alpine high temperature metamorphic and deformation of an extensional shell zone contest. What uh, is uh, uh, in common between these uh, two different uh, geological contests is that in both situations we can find a strong lithological contrast, uh, namely uh, ultramafic, mafic rocks in close contact with uh, metasediments, for example. So let's start from uh, the first case study. So we are in the Cima di Gagnone area, that is situated in the Central Alps especially in the Cima Lunga unit. Uh, this is uh, exactly an example of uh, ultra high pressure, high temperature, ultra mafic lenses that enveloped uh, um, amphibolate facies uh, metasediments. This was uh, nothing else than the results of the alpine subduction and the collision of different deformation phases. In the past, uh, uh, lots of uh, works and studies were focused on uh, understand and investigate uh, ultramafic lenses, uh, but uh, during my PhD, I focus uh, mostly on uh, the metasediments, on the host rocks. So the question here uh, were focused on trying to constrain the uh, evolution metamorphic path of uh, the host rocks to compare this evolution with the results from literature uh, relative to ultramafic and uh, understand better the processes that occur at the boundary between these two different lithologies. The starting point was a detailed um, fieldwork and sampling strategy. In fact, um, what uh, uh, we did is to um, collect a sample representative of host rocks um, with an increasing distance from ultramafic, not uh, forcefully following a gradient, but uh, with an following an increasing distance in order to better investigate how um, and what uh, host rocks recorded. Um, and uh, so they col we collected two different group of sample. A first group uh, was uh, called country rocks because it was collected with an increasing distance between 10 and 50 meters respect to the ultramafic rocks. And the second group of sample was collected uh, from the, directly from the contact of the ultramafic lenses uh, minus two meters uh, and it was called HELOS. The field observation uh, on the, the field work was uh, fundamental because uh, um, uh, I highlight the fact that uh, both metasediments and ultramafic uh, uh, share the same deformation features. Uh, in fact, we have uh, non-cylindrical folds uh, that are um, um, in, uh, developed in the weak metasediments, and this envelop uh, the more competent uh, ultramafic lenses that, uh, in turn, uh, experience uh, fracturing and rotation. This means that uh, was an important observation because uh, uh, this means that at some point uh, these rocks uh, deform together. 
Another important field evidence consisted in partial melting in the meta sediments that is not uh, uh, homogeneously uh, developed but focused towards or extreme in proximity of ultramafic lenses. Um, I perform a petrographical observation and uh, what uh, um, I observe is that uh, um, mineral assemblage for country rocks and halos is not uh, so different except for the uh, presence of kyanite and staurolite in country rocks, uh, meaning of recalibration under articulate faces and uh, um, also the texture is uh, um, uh, highlighted by EBSD map was mainly uh, schistos. Uh, in Ellis sample, uh, the mineral assemblage is uh, uh, similar, but we didn't observe a staurolite, and uh, also the quartz uh, is very um, not is not abundant a lot. And another important important uh, observation we did is the particular observation of. Uh, a uh, coronitic uh, microstructure made by relit of monazite surrounded by alanite and surrounded by clinazovite. Uh, and the texture also for this uh, um, sample is different because uh, what it was alight by EBSD map is that the texture is mainly uh, granoblastic and not schistos like for country rocks. Another, in, another difference uh, consisted in uh, the uh, type of garnet because for country rocks, we observe uh, uh, two different types of garnet uh, that we subdivided in uh, inclusion rich, inclusion poor. Whereas uh, for Hellas, the garnet is very homogeneous and uh, poor of inclusion. Um, I perform uh, by using a Perplex software um, the pressure temperature uh, um, uh, diagrams. And uh, uh, what we find is that uh, um, country rocks recorded the middle pressure temperature conditions uh, between uh, 650 720 degrees and pressure around 1.0 1.2 gigapascal, that is coherent with the previous studies relative to these country rocks. Um, coherent with our equilibration under amphibolite phases conditions. In the HELOS, we find higher uh, pressure temporal peak conditions that reach also um, eight, uh, um, 850 degrees and uh, pressure of 1.7 gigapascal. And these conditions are closer to the condition recorded in literature um, by ultramafic rocks. Um, I perform preliminary also uh, geochronological data on uh, uh, zircon from the two different group of sample. And uh, what I find is that uh, zircon from country rocks records mainly pre-alpine ages uh, between Cambra, uh, Cambra Nodovician and Devonian Carboniferous, whereas Helos, um, zircon in zircon in Helos, uh, uh, show mainly a thick rim uh, that uh, uh, mostly recorded an alpine exhumation. Uh, this is, was an interesting result because this overlap um, the, uh, re, um, the age recorded by the ultramafic uh, rocks. So put uh, together all this information, uh, what we um, observe is that uh, even if uh, the ultramafic and uh, the metasediment share the same deformation and structural evolution, uh, metasediment recorded the different uh, pressure temperature conditions. And we observe that this uh, as a, is a, a function of the distance uh, to the ultramafic body. So we, um, we saw, in fact, that the country rocks show a uh, PT condition uh, relative to amphibole facie condition, mostly, whereas the halos uh, show uh, mostly higher conditions. And if we compare all these uh, uh, results with uh, also uh, with all data available in literature, we can see that uh, uh, we have a strong differences of pressure and temperature between country rocks and dramatic rocks, where the halos is in the middle. So the, con the conclusion of this observation, our interpretation was that uh, the halos sample, so the sample focus uh, surrounded the, the, um, the ultramafic body, uh, were affected by a fluid rock interaction. 
um, this, this process was uh, strongly localized at the interface between ultramafic and the other country rocks. And it uh, was this uh, fluid rock interaction that allowed the, um, the uh, re-equilibration during high tempo phases. All these results uh, are very important because they open uh, um, and provide new information uh, about which is the model, the geodynamic model that can help to explain how uh, was the exhumation of Cimalunga unit. Uh, but uh, what we know is that uh, uh, until now, all models have shortcomings and uh, no one of that can uh, completely and in a completely way explain the evolution of the Cima Lunga unit. So what I tried to do uh, during my postdoc was uh, to uh, try to constrain better the time, uh, the evolution of, uh, uh, of, uh, of this uh, types of rocks and uh, so I uh, perform also monazite data uh, beside the, the zircon and the monazite in country rocks uh, are uh, uh, tiny and elongated, very small and sometimes it was difficult to analyze them. Uh, whereas in ELOS uh, we have that uh, uh, monazite uh, occur in the particular coronitic texture that I showed before and uh, um, is a mainly a relict of 250-500 micron, is rimmed by alanite and in turn surrounded by clinozozite. Clean the results by uh, zircon uh, as function of uh, the distance so confirm the preliminary data that uh, I performed during PhD. So the HALO sample uh, recorded mostly an alpine high pressure stage, uh, that overlap the, um, the time of evolution of the peak of uh, ultramafic rocks, whereas the country rocks uh, show mainly, um, uh, the zircon country rocks mainly record the prevariscan signal. Monazite uh, behave in a uh, quite opposite way, in the meaning that uh, in Helos, uh, monazite confirm again um, and recorded an alpine high pressure stage between 42 and 37 million years, but the monazite in the country rocks uh, mostly recorded uh, younger uh, events under uh, two, uh, 22 million years that refer mostly to the cooling stage of the area. So these results were very interesting also in order to investigate how different uh, geochronometers, important geochronometers such as zircon and monazite, record different episodes of evolution of uh, uh, particular study rocks. So in conclusion of this uh, uh, case study, uh, we can say that uh, metasediments recorded different uh, pressure temperature time conditions as a function of the distance from the ultramafic lenses. So, so uh, what is important to, to pay attention is uh, the sampling strategy and also the role of fluid when uh, uh, we study some particular contests such as this one. And uh, for sure, we need still uh, further investigation in order to understand better um, which is the tectonic model that uh, can explain uh, this area. So now let's move to the second case study. So uh, we are talking about uh, the Ivrea Verbano zone. Uh, we are in the uh, Southern Alps and uh, this area is uh, studied a lot because it's one of the few areas in the world that uh, is possible to, uh, to observe uh, um, outcrops relative to lower continental crust that uh, refer to a pre-alpine uh, um, evolution. Um, in fact, it is a, a, a fossil exum passive margin uh, that uh, um, is uh, characterized by ultramafic pipes intruded into a volcano sedimentary metamorphic sequence that managed to escape uh, the alpine subduction. Uh, another important thing is that uh, it's possible to study um, the exhumation rifting uh, uh, stage that it experienced and also uh, do the shear zone that develop during uh, um, this uh, uh, rifting, rifting stage. Of this uh, shear zone, I focus uh, during my PhD on the Anzola shear zone. Um, this uh, uh, 
was uh, believed in the previous studies uh, that uh, develop within a strong, hard and isotropic uh, um, gabbro uh, and mafic body. And this is a paradox because uh, uh, will be expected that uh, develop mostly in the surrounding the weaker and isotropic metamorphic sequence. And uh, uh, another thing so is that uh, the Andalashar zone was believed to, um, to uh, play an uh, important role during Triassic and Jurassic uh, Tetian rifting. Uh, even if it was interpreted uh, in these works in this way, a detailed characterization uh, at the meso and micro scale was still lacking. And so during my PhD, I tried to characterize the compositional and structural feature of the shell zone, try to identify which, is, uh, the, uh, which was the protolith of melonitic rocks, recognize uh, which factor control the nucleation of uh, the shell zone and find trying to uh, collocate a better uh, the evolution uh, in the regional rifting evolution. As a for Cima di Gagnone, also here I started from a detailed geological mapping of the Anzola area. And in particular, uh, I, um, I perform a detailed uh, um, sampling collection, not only considering the shell zone rock, rocks, but also the uh, hanging wall and the foot wall. And uh, another thing that uh, I uh, try to consider is that uh, from uh, um, southeast to northwest, uh, we have uh, an increasing of metamorphic conditions from amphibolite to granulate phages. So um, already from the fieldwork was possible to observe that uh, the shell zone um, nucleate mostly at uh, the transition between um, migmatites under amphibolate phages and uh, granulate phages, and also in between we have uh, the mafic uh, rocks. So I uh, did a sketch of, uh, um, of the Anzola shell zone uh, with a relative uh, hanging wall and foot wall. And uh, what was possible uh, to serve on the field work is that uh, uh, the shear zone is uh, not only developed within the um, amphibolite uh, rocks, the mafic rocks, uh, as was uh, stated in previous works, uh, but also in uh, paragnesis rocks. Um, and uh, so, uh, firstly, we saw that there was a strong et um, lithological heterogeneity. Uh, sometimes we observe also the occurrence of lococratic layers, uh, the presence of corundum lithologies, and uh, so very heterogeneous, also in terms of strain, uh, because we have alternating layer of uh, myl myelonites, ultramyelonites, and uh, boudin. The angle wall is mostly characterized by migmatites uh, under uh, amphibolate phages conditions. And uh, uh, the foot wall will serve um, the isotropic uh, mafic uh, rocks. And uh, uh, what was interesting to observe, uh, um, that was observed for the first time, is that in between, uh, um, in between uh, of the, the shell zone and the, uh, the gabroic body, we have a particularly um, folded, uh, uh, we have a folded alternating lithologies made by uh, mafic rocks, uh, um, paragnesis, uh, calcilicates. And also what is interesting to serve is that uh, um, closely at the contact between these folded layers and the isotropic gabbro, we have a pocket, like a metasomatic pocket of garnet, pyroxene, plagioclase, and calcilicate layer. So what we observe is that the Anzola shell zone develop within a, a very heterogeneous multilithological sequence at the boundary between uh, amphibolite and granulite phages conditions. In order to better understand which was the real protolith of uh, the uh, melonitic rocks, I uh, focus mostly on melonitic amphibolites. Um, so um, what was observed on melonitic amphibolites is that uh, it made by um, the al alternating layer amphibolo-rich layers and clinopyroxene-rich layers. And uh, 
comparing uh, the petrographical results between uh, melonitic amphibolites and gabbro, we observe actually that the mineral assemblage is very, um, very similar, is quite almost the same. But uh, the, the, the interesting uh, difference was that uh, while the melonitic amphibolite is uh, um, uh, characterized by the presence of abundant zircon and titanite, the gabbro is completely free from them. Then I, um, I focus uh, mostly on uh, clinopyroxene because it was uh, the mineral that showed best uh, the difference between, uh, um, uh, between uh, the uh, different rocks because uh, clinopyroxene in, uh, um, in the gabbro is mainly augite for uh, amphibo-rich layers is mainly diopside, but for the clinopyroxene-rich layers, uh, the um, clinopyrex is mainly Edenbergite, and this composition overlaps the composition um, shown by clinopyrex in, in calcilicates from the foot wall. So this means that probably the clinopyrex in rich layers um, was uh, a calcilicates that was minonitized and is more similar to the foot wall rock. These features was uh, further confirmed by trace element on clinopyroxene because uh, uh, we observe that uh, uh, mylonites here expressing with the diamonds, uh, the pattern mostly overlap the pattern relative to clinopyroxene for mafic rocks and calcilicates uh, um, from the foot wall and angle wall. And this differ strongly from the uh, gabbro, uh, the pattern from clinoparks in, from the gabbro composition. So thanks to this uh, uh, strong observation, uh, we um, could say that uh, actually the mylonites, mostly um, the protolites of mylonites was not the gabbro, but uh, the uh, volcano metasedimentary sequence that uh, compose the uh, host rocks. I also try to determine the pressure temperature conditions, uh, both of pressure conditions that were uh, confirmed uh, performing different geothermobarometry models uh, and methods, uh, that is between granulite to upper amphibolite phases. Whereas for um, the uh, mylonites, the conditions were uh, confirmed between uh, started at high temperate conditions and then went down to amphibolate phases conditions. So summing, uh, summing up all this observation, uh, we could say that uh, the localization of the Anzala Shell Zone was promoted by the overlapping of uh, several factors. The uh, first of all was uh, um, the transition metamorphic boundary between a layer under amphibolite uh, conditions uh, full of anhydrous minerals and, uh, um, sorry, uh, full of hydrous minerals and a granulite conditions full of anhydrous minerals. And the second factor was uh, the fact that uh, the Anzola Shell Zone managed to find a weak layer from a logical point of view uh, that was between a strong, weak, anisotropic folded metasediment sequence and the isotropic gabbro. This allow, allowed the Anzala shell zone to nucleate uh, along this layer um, and, uh, and uh, the problem is that what is still uh, um, a question at this point was when the Anzala shell zone actually uh, was active. So during my postdoc, what I did is try to uh, better constrain the activity of the Anzala shell zone, and uh, I perform um, a detailed petrochronological and microstructural investigation on titanite from the melonitic uh, amphibolites and the calcilicates, how we determine after this first study. Um, what was interesting is that, uh, um, how it's possible to see here, um, he, the titanite from uh, um, amphibolite and calcilicate uh, recorded the formation in different way because titanite from amphibolites was 
mostly um, deformed towards the rims, whereas uh, in Titan and in Calcilicate is mostly uh, is mostly undeformed. But uh, thanks to the uh, overlapping and correlation uh, between uran uranium lead data and uh, um, chemistry and uh, microstructural information uh, that was possible thanks to um, performing the laser split stream on this uh, titanite, um, we managed to uh, find a, a young intercept age uh, at Jurassic time especially at 189 million years, that, uh, um, that was better recorded, especially uh, how it's possible to see from uh, the um, amount of points that is aligned in this uh, uranium light diagram, um, by, is better recorded by uh, amphibolite layers. So um, this, uh, um, these results, overlapping all these uh, results, uh, we can see that uh, uh, titanite manage uh, and is uh, um, a powerful geochronometer that manages to say that when uh, the, the formation of the Anzolasher zone uh, um, was active, and this age that we find overlap also the uh, geochronological results that are available for um, the uh, adjacent shell zone that outcrop a different crustal layer uh, in the Ivrea Verbano zone. So uh, the question that now I'm trying uh, to unravel in this contest is, uh, but uh, so when the uh, Gabbro, uh, the Anzola Gabbro intruded, and especially another question was that is still enigmatic is, uh, why the Anzola shell zone nucleated uh, not immediately in the contact with the Gabbro, but uh, we have this particular package of folded uh, metamorphic rocks. Uh, a way in order to uh, try to unravel uh, um, the time when the Gabbro intruded, uh, since uh, the absence of uh, important geochronometers such as uh, zircon and titanite, uh, we um, try to focus on garnet, uh, that is uh, focus uh, and uh, its presence uh, uh, at the contact with uh, the gabbro bo uh, gabbroic body. For this uh, reason, uh, at the beginning of this year, I um, managed to, won, uh, to win a, a grant in order to um, to go to Germany in Karlsruhe and work with uh, Aratz Beranoguire, that is an expert in uh, the uh, uranium lead dating. Uh, and so what uh, I tried here is to um, test uh, a lot of uh, uh, different um, thin section samples of different lithologies, uh, metamorphic grade and geological contest. And among this uh, uh, thin section, I tried also to date uh, this metasomatic uh, garnet. The age that we managed uh, uh, to find was uh, relative to 250, 240 million years. And this, uh, if we compare with the results uh, from titanite, uh, are very interesting because uh, um, the, uh, our hypothesis is that probably the Anzala shell zone nucleated along a weak layer that probably was weakened by the intrusion of this Gabbro with this data uh, was very interesting. In order to have uh, further constraint, we analyzed also monazite from uh, um, both uh, myelonites and both uh, the uh, paragnises in the fruit wall. Um, and what we find is that also monazite from the foot wall and the folded layers recorded the age between 260 to 130 million years. Um, that uh, is coherent with a possible uh, metasomatic processes uh, due to the intrusion of the Gabbro. And also this is further constrained by the occurrence in these uh, um, rocks of, cor of corundum that in uh, several studies uh, is uh, um, stated is that uh, corundum probably form in this case uh, by the strong interaction between aluminosilicate uh, rocks and uh, um, mafic rocks uh, such as gabbro. 
And also the monazite from Milonites was interesting because it recorded an age between 230 and 190 million years that mostly overlap the age uh, relative to Titanite. This work actually is still uh, in progress and is uh, what I'm trying to uh, unravel better now. But uh, what I want to leave a like, message for you is that uh, in this complex situation, if you combine uh, different uh, uranium-led methods and systematics on different geochronometers and different minerals, uh, um, it's interesting to see how different uh, um, geochronometers record different processes and also how it's possible to fill some uh, and provide new information. So for these uh, case studies, uh, the hypothesis is that uh, um, during uh, a Permian uh, event, uh, the Ibraverbano zone experienced uh, mostly a, um, an postorogenic extension process uh, that was followed by intrusion of mafic magma um, within uh, the, the metamorphic rocks that compose the Ibraverbano zone. And probably among this, uh, there was uh, the intrusion also uh, of, uh, um, of the Anzala Gabbro, maybe. Um, during uh, uh, Triassic Jurassic, uh, there was the uh, initiation of rifting uh, processes with uh, the development of a shell zone. Among this, uh, the Anzala shell zone probably was um, played a significant role in accommodating the, the, the formation at these crustal levels. What is still uh, work uh, as in progress is uh, uh, really to find uh, better a uh, constraint of the Anzola Gabbro intrusion. As a conclusion of all my presentation, that uh, I give you, I think, a lot of uh, information and new, a lot of data, um, we can say that uh, um, uh, with my multidisciplinary approach, uh, I, what, is, what I try to do is to provide the new information, trying to unravel complex geodynamic area and uh, contest. And, uh, focus on crustalological boundaries actually was uh, nice because we really managed to find something interesting and, and new. And uh, some uh, message to leave you to take home is uh, in your case studies, always consider the, all the lithologies that are involved in the area and not focus only on metric rocks, ultramafic rocks, or only on metasediments. And uh, so consider also the fact that uh, um, rocks uh, have different uh, rological behavior. And uh, this is observed also not only at the mesoscale, but also the micro scale. And uh, also the, the same geochronometers uh, um, records a different uh, episode of the evolution of our rocks, uh, independent of where you look, you look at. And so um, also consider the, the possible interconnection that there is between uh, uh, fluid rock interaction, deformation, and metamorphic uh, processes. And so with uh, this, I thank you for the attention. Thank you very much, Stefania, for the great presentation. And now we have some time for some questions. If you guys want to ask something. You, it's your time. I can start just with uh, one single question. First of all, I want to congratulate you on your work and on getting your PhD on the topic, which is pretty cool. I think I'm Thank biased, you. but I think it's pretty cool. Uh, on your second paper, on the Titanite paper, uh, how would you envisage doing something else in terms of, or, or just in the first case as well, doesn't really matter. Uh, how would you envisage next steps on your research in terms of investigating the role of fluids or more specifically targeting the fluids as well, because they participate pretty strongly in the control of the chemistry, the rheology and so on. And then how would you envisage this, how you would tackle and if you are interested in doing this section? Yeah. Um, for uh, I start from the first case study from Cima di Gagnone, for example. Um, we, um, what probably I forgot to say is that in what we did is also to compare the bulk rock composition 
between uh, uh, the data relative to ultramafics and also the Ostrox. And actually what we find is that uh, um, also the bulk, bulk rock from Helos and the country rocks were different because uh, bulk rock in Helos is, uh, was richer in calcium, for example, or in, um, in poorer in magnesium and uh, iron. So in elements that uh, um, allowed us to, to um, hypothesize that probably there was a, a strong interconnection between um, the ultramafic, the ultramafics that is, um, also characterized the rims of uh, amphibole, chlorite, and so comparing also the bulk rock composition that I try also to modelize uh, um, this possible chemical exchange with perplex, was possible so to interpret that uh, there was a strongly localized interconnection between these two different uh, group of rocks. And so from there, uh, I started to, to to focus more and say, okay, try try to go on and also about constraining the, the processes. And it was a, an internal fluid, an exotic fluid, and uh, uh, but the, all the observation that I did actually uh, supported the, a very localized uh, situation. Like uh, if the, uh, the water was uh, um, released by an exchange and dehydration and hydration processes directly from ultramafic and uh, meta sediments. Um, for the, the second case study, um, uh, you refer to titanite, you mean, uh, right, about... Uh, yeah, because uh, your titanite, the deformation style, it seems much much more like a uh, yes, yes. pinch. Yes, yes. It's more like a yes. pinch microstructure instead of like a full crystallographic misorientation. Yes, exactly. Uh, in fact, uh, also here, um, we interpreted that probably this different uh, um, deformation uh, in the titanite was due to a different uh, water uh, water content uh, in uh, each domain, because in fact uh, the titanite that record better the deformation is and also the chemical variation is uh, occurring in the amphibola in the amphibolite rich layers. Um, and so in the layers that uh, is uh, characterized by amphibole. And so also here, um, we hypothesize that uh, the water was actually very strongly localized along grain boundaries because uh, um, this was released by the amphibole itself and uh, was also here a very micro scale uh, processes because uh, if, uh, if we have a, a lots of fluids, we would expect a, a completely recrystallized titanite, but we didn't observe that. So for this reason, the fact that we observe the formation in titanite only focus on the rims, uh, we could say that uh, was only a, a localized process. And, uh, and uh, also this is supported by the fact that uh, in... Uh, Calcilicate, titanite is all, mostly not the form. Um, there are grains that are uh, the forms, uh, but uh, are less. And this is because calcilicate uh, were mostly um, anhydrous. We don't have uh, um, uh, amphibole. And so uh, titanite in this layer is less reactive instead of in the amphibole, in amphibole layers. Yeah, I just have one comment about this is that it can mm -hmm. the difference in the deformation style could also be just strain localization. So if you have different mineral assemblages, one it's going to be weaker and easier to deform, yes. and then the type yes. is going to be undeformed, exactly. and then the other one you have much rigid grains, and then the titanite will be pinched on the edges. Uh, if I can suggest anything, uh, I yeah. will try to do some oxygen isotope profiles across mm -hmm. the grain from the most deformed tips towards the core. There's a paper in geology that they use this to infer the, the duration of the deformation process. So that will be cool if you find some variation. Yeah, thanks. Thanks. And uh, but now what I'm trying to do uh, also is uh, to focus mostly on uh, 
the deformation mechanism in these different uh, domains. And uh, in fact, uh, I already performed some specific EBSD map on the amphibo-rich domains and the calcilicates in order to better understand uh, in terms of the deformation mechanism, how, how this is distributed, because it's uh, also what we see in uh, not only in titanite, but also in other uh, the main mineral phases, such as anti-volcanoparacy and plagioclase. So now, in fact, I started to focus also on, uh, on this subset. Yeah, that's great. Thanks for the talk. I'm looking forward to for the future papers. Thank you very much. Thanks. So here we have uh, lots of comments by Maida. She starts saying, excellent talk, Stefania. Thank you very much for sharing such an interest. Oh, oops, it's kind of way. For interest research, very interesting results showing variations of ages of rocks closely associated. And also Antonio Gilberto Costa also said, congratulations to Stefania for excellent presentation. Uh, now I uh, send us some questions. Uh, you have mentioned that it is not straightforward finding a geotectonic model for the PTT reconstruction you have presented for study case one. What are the main probable scenarios in your opinion? Yeah, because uh, in my presentation, I show mostly three different uh, situations that are uh, what in literature are uh, the most important that is uh, the uh, model of uh, tectonic melange of current unit and of uh, trusting models. There is a huge debate on uh, this kind of contest, especially in the Cima di Gagnone area. Um, but uh, with my studies uh, um, and the, the reason why I say that until now, no one of that can explain is that uh, the tectonic melange uh, explain, can explain why we have uh, different uh, metamorphic PT records because uh, the tectonic melange is uh, different blocks that are um, exhumed in different way. Uh, but uh, it doesn't expl explain uh, in my results why uh, we didn't serve uh, mylonites or uh, the formation um, uh, or cataclasite uh, strongly localized uh, surrounded ultramatic. So this for sure um, is not, can not be possible. The second model is uh, the coherent unit that uh, um, support uh, the fact uh, that we have, uh, uh, like in our field work observation, the uh, ultramafic rocks and uh, the host rocks that uh, they form together at some point, but it doesn't support why we have uh, different metamorphic uh, records. And the, the third one is uh, the trusting model that can support uh, um, uh, both the pressure, temperature, time, the different metamorphic uh, records, and also the fact of the current unit. But what doesn't support is uh, um, how explain uh, this uh, big uh, temperature differences uh, between the uh, host rocks and ultramafic. So all have shortcomings. So the, my suggestion is. Uh, to probably to find a new model, uh, a new model that can uh, try to merge all uh, this uh, information, or that can uh, um, that can um, explain. One uh, an idea that actually we are trying to to explain is that probably uh, the Chimalunga unit was uh, sandwiched uh, during the zoomation between uh, the, the adjacent uh, uh, nap, uh, and probably during this uh, sandwiching, um, this was created uh, a possible strong differences between temperature and pressure. Um, but uh, uh, it's something that is still uh, in progress and uh, need to 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 be um, demonstrated uh, very careful. Right. <clears throat> um, so Mayra says that there is a follow-up to her your first her first question, um, which says that would it be possible that a condition of the related to another previous metamorphic event? Um, 
I, I guess no, because uh, um, I think that the ultramafic actually recorded uh, the real PT peak uh, conditions relative to the alpine has is also demonstrated by the the zircon and all the the geochronological data that were performed by Gebauer on uh, uh, ultramafics um, and also because even my uh, my results um, show that uh, actually at the alpine stage we have uh, this uh, pressure temporal conditions and uh, interaction between these two different uh, rocks um, probably um, i i i'm trust to say that uh, during alpine there was uh, uh, this uh, these processes but uh, to say before i guess that uh, uh, we, we need uh, more information. So I will actually, I mean, my, I had a question that is very linked to this second one of my era, which was actually related to the case study one and more exactly to um, the relationship between the ultramafics and the surrounding metasedimentary rocks in terms of structures, because you said that the formation is the same, but, um, but the PT conditions, uh, the PT field that is shown by these two lithologies uh, is different. Is it possible, or I don't, I know that you didn't really focus on the ultramafics, but yeah, um, yeah. I don't know if other, uh, yeah, if there, there were previous studies that the ultramafics actually um, within those lenses and those wood ends preserve like a previous fabric as a relic. And then the dominant overprint is the, is, let's say the the yeah the regional foliation that wraps also the lenses and that is um dominant in the in the host rock in the metasedimentary rocks and uh yeah yeah uh, yeah but uh, um because uh, um what we can say also based on the the data geological data from uh, the country rocks that are recorded uh, all the ages we can say that uh, so the question is when these uh, two rocks uh, couple together mm -hmm. and uh, yes this is this is true but um, i cannot say exactly in which uh, moment but uh, what we can say uh, from our results is that uh, during the uh, alpine uh, peak conditions they were together were already in contact with each other um, mm -hmm. the hypothesis can be that uh, probably they uh, couple during alpine but uh, uh, nothing excludes that probably uh, probably were already previously, but uh, um, but the alpine the alpine uh, moment uh, uh, equilibrated uh, many situations. That so it's not so easy to find uh, uh, a relative situation. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Um, I just have All another right. quick question uh, that was on the case study too. I don't know if I lost like a bit of the, um, the last mm -hmm. part, but did you obtain uh, eventually um, data for the um, uh, uranium lead geochronology that you already did? I uh, think I lost on the garnet. Uh, yeah, on, on the, the garnet. garnet. Yeah, sorry. Uh, yes, because, yes, in fact, I said that uh, I test many thin sections, yeah. different situation. Um, I So um, in few words, uh, what I... Um, what I can say is that some, not all garnets are datable. And with this te test, it was uh, interesting because uh, I uh, had the opportunity to better understand which are the kind of garnet and rocks with garnet that can be datable. And what I uh, concluded is that uh, um, the nice, uh, First of all, depends on uh, three main factors, on the um, bulk uh, rock composition, on the occurrence of other um, minerals, such as accessory minerals that can contain a lot of uh, uranium lead, and, um, and all these factors control also the um, uranium uh, content in the garnet of your, your study rocks. 
and um, and the garnet that I managed to find the reliable ages are, for example, the best was from the 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 case I show you that are from metasomatic uh, conditions. Uh, that is mostly a grossular uh, uh, type of garnet. Uh, and then uh, um, it was possible to find something uh, where uh, there was not the presence of uh, a lot of zircon, a lot of monazite and so uh, geochronometers. And uh, for example, I tried also myelonites and for myelonites it was not possible because it's a very open system uh, and uh, the garnet uh, lowers always uh, the uranium uh, in these uh, situations. Um, and uh, yes, yeah, so I, I try to, yeah. to find also some, uh, some uh, differences in this, uh, in this way. I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the calcium rich uh, garnet is the one that yeah. works. And um, uh, would you consider in like, for example, like trying other uh, in other systematics, isotope systematics, like uh, lutetium hafnium in garnet or it's not in your um, plan? I suggest, yes, uh, I think that it will be interesting to, to combine also also because uranium lead in garnet is still a very new method. So, um, so uh, in order to, to be sure of what garnet, uh, because the, the question is still, okay, we date uranium lead in garnet, but what, uh, what date garnet really? The, when it forms the rocks or when, when uh, there is uh, another processes uh, later. So uh, with my results, probably also on Garnet from uh, the Anzola that I studied, uh, uh, in my idea um, should be when uh, the Garnet uh, originated and formed. But uh, I think also that this depends on the situation uh, and the context. Um, so uh, it's something that still uh developing and so i suggest to combine with uh, with other systematics uh, if uh, there is the possibility that uh, other systematics that are more uh, more re re reliable okay thank you just, just a follow up on the discussion about the garnet uh it's pretty well known nowadays that the only garnets that work pretty much for granulite are grossular andradite garnets which are associated to methasomatism and scar, especially scar deposits. Yes. Everything else, the uranium, initial uranium content is too low. And then how much garnet do you have in your samples in terms of volume abundance, more or less? Uh, it depends because, uh, yes, for example, in the, the garnet from the Anzola, was com I selected the... Uh, area only formed by garnet, so almost uh, 100% mm -hmm. in this case. But um, in other thin sections, were uh, um, 50 50 percent in volume of the thin section, or yeah. uh, or less. But um, uh, yes, yeah, actually. So I didn't find uh, um, a correlation with uh, the garnet abundance and the, the reliability of ages. This I noticed that is not strongly correlated. Yeah, but this is certainly a problem for lutetium hafnium, as Silvia suggested, because mm. lutetium strongly partitions to garnet. But once you have so much garnet, all your lutetium is going to be partitioned in the, uh, in pretty small concentrations to all garnets. And then if you try in situ lutetium hafnium with uh, collision cell methods using triple quads or anything, uh, it's difficult that that's going to work because there's uh, your lutetium, your initial lutetium concentration is going to be very low. So if you want to be, if you want to try lutetium hafnium and be successful, just try to look for samples with not a lot of garnet, something less than 10, 15% of garnet to increase your, your chances. But yeah, I think, I think lutetium hafnium would be better uh, than uranium lead for sure. 
yeah, in terms of uh, also development of the method uh, for sure. Uh, yeah. What is nice uh, uh, that I tested in uh, in Germany during my two months is that uh, actually the uh, the instruments is very powerful. So actually, I I manage sometimes to uh, test uh, um, the uranium lead techniques on garnet with a very very low amount of uh, uranium uh, under uh, under one ppm and uh, zero. Point uh, one, so yeah, very very. Did you use some... did you use much collector ISPMS? Yes, yes. Yeah, and uh, but uh, um, beside the uranium uh, led the uh, uranium content, uh, what was important it was also the ratio with uh, the uh, lead content. So in order to test that was uh, sometimes maybe there was uh, enough uranium but not the lead uh, ration so it was not, lead, yeah. yeah exactly exactly just common uh, yeah 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 challenging <laughs> yes <laughs> hi stefana and um, thank you for our presentation it was really nice and interesting and really enjoy that thank you and i just have one quick question I would talk. I would like to talk about more about fluids. I saw in the both case that it's really important. To, you need to think about these fluids related to the metamorphic fluids or and about the metamorphism also. But what do you think that it, how you can deal with the do not to know where come this fluid is this always from the meta sediment or come from another another source what do you think about that in both mm -hmm. cases in, uh, actually the the, re the reply to to both ca case is uh, that uh, for both cases the the fluids were not an exotic fluid but uh, localized and i could say that because for the cima di gagnone area uh, we have observation like um, uh, partial melting and also uh, particular mineral association that are only uh, observable surrounded the, the ultramafic bodies. Uh, if I expected that if we have a, an exotic fluid, I would expect it something uh, observable also in the in the country rocks, but actually country rocks we didn't observe. Um, a strong uh, uh, or uh, fluid uh, interaction. We have uh, migmatites in country rocks, uh, but uh, are uh, um, relative to a, a younger event uh, of 22 million years. That is what Monazite recorded, uh, but is not uh, correlated this event to the Alpine uh, PT record that is recorded by Helos and, uh, um, and Ultramafic. So we are I'm talking about two different episodes in this context. And in the second case, um, I say that the, um, the, the fluids also here is something that is strongly localized along grain boundaries, also because uh, um, in the case, for example, also of titanite, uh, uh, we would expect, if we would have a pervasive or a, a strong exotic, we should have uh, all something resetting. But what we observe actually is only a, a partial resetting or uh, not a completely. Uh, and so uh, with this observation, we, we can say that uh, the, the fluid was only localized along uh, brain boundaries and not uh, in completing a pervasive way along the along the um, the rocks. Thank you. Thank you. So, Stefania, uh, thanks again for your great presentation. Uh, sure, it was helpful for a lot of people who worked with metamorphism and structural geology, macro macro tectonics. So that was pretty yeah. nice. I read your, your articles about the Anzola's shear zone, they are great. So I, I, I hope I could I can read all, uh, your future your future papers. So I think we, sh we sh can finish 
the day. Okay. Uh, thanks again for joining us. Thank you, Bruno. Thank you, Regina. Thanks again. Thanks, Silvia, that had to, to leave. Uh, for... Thanks again for inviting me. Of course. No, we but... are honored that you accepted that our invitation. Uh, you had you you gave a great presentation, and I hope we can uh, talk to talk to you soon. Uh, talk to you again pretty soon. So thank you very much, Stefania. Thank yes. everyone that that watch us. And yeah, we will see yeah, you. Thank you. Next time. Thank you. Best. Thank you. Bye, guys. Thank, thank you, you very, very much. much. Bye, bye. Bye, bye.